Hello Internet, thanks for coming back or thanks for joining for the first time. Um, what I'm doing here is uh, trying to build a channel where I can do what I love and that is repairing photos and adjusting photos, that's my main thing. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years off and on, well more on than off. I've adjusted millions and millions of photos and usually they've got to be done very quickly because I worked in the printing industry and time is important. So the techniques I'm going to show are not what you would say boutique photo restoration techniques. These are practical techniques for doing a number of photos or for a hobbyist to jump in and do their own photos. At least up to a decent standard where they are presentable and you can put them in the album or view them on computer and share them with the family, whatever. Anyway, let's dive in. Uh, this photo here was uh, water damaged in a house fire. And overall, it's not too bad. So hopefully I can just make a nice presentable version of it um, that the owner can use in their, um, in their website or family album, whatever they want to do with it. So let's get in there. So first thing I'm going to do is what I always do convert to CMYK so that the adjustments are more intuitive and easier to do. So I've done that. Now I'm looking at the distortion. This is shot with a camera phone and it looks like it's on somebody's knee or something like that. So it's a bit out of square and the proportions look pretty good so I'm just going to square it up. So I want to distort the image so what I'll do is I'll do another of my standard early steps is to duplicate the base channel and keep that as a backup now the background copy I'm going to do a transform so I'll get the transform tool sorry I did the shortcut on my keyboard I shouldn't do that it's control T on a PC or it's this tool up here and um, we're going to transform it and now I see at the bottom we've got a line running up at an angle so that tells me roughly how the photo is distorted so I'm going to just counteract that if I hold control I can move one corner of the image and just square up that bottom line I'll just do it by eye that's going to be good enough and a little bit on this top corner square this one up also and to me that looks fairly natural just tweak that a little bit okay and then i'm going to crop it it looks a tiny bit wide to me but it's only intuitively you know the the owner of this photo could look at that and say well she looks a bit wider than reality and then i'll just readjust it whatever i'm just going by a bit of intuition here okay that looks about right and then I'll go to the crop tool and I'm not going to set it to a standard cropping proportion which you can do up here where it says a ratio you can set it to the normal uh, 1 by 4.1 ratio like paper sizes or something like that or 6 by 9 or something but I'm not going to do that because it doesn't really suit this image uh, I'm just going to do it to what I think looks good and I'll commit that change and then let's have a little zoom in and see what we got <clears throat> okay it's quite pixelated it's a pretty low resolution image so let's start by upping the resolution in which case we'll go um, a, we'll go image size which is alt control i uh, whatever that is on the mac i can't remember but I'm sure you Mac users will know what it is. Now you'll see I'm going from 72, the original size here was 72 pixels to the inch and I like to go up in multiples because it seems mathematically to make sense that that'll be a smoother transition if you go multiples of 72 like 72 to 144 to 288 and I've found by experience that it usually works better. Um, so I'm going 288, so that's four times the pixel count in each direction. 
So it goes from a half a meg up to seven and a half, seven and a bit meg. And that's a decent size thousand. And 1120 pixels by 1600 odd. So it's a good big size. Now the resample uh, left on here is nearest neighbor hard edges, which still keeps the pixel shapes. But if we go automatic or into one of the smoother versions, you'll see that preview there changed to much smoother better looking image. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So already she's looking better. The pixelation is much less. It's quite smooth. And she's still got some strange artifacts showing, which is not great, but we've got to work with what we've got. So what can I do now? I would like to do some tonal adjustment. So I'm going to add an adjustment layer. So a non-destructive adjustment layer. And my normal one to start with is levels. So that currently is sitting above the background layer and the original base layer. And I don't want to change every layer below it. So if I hold Alt key, and float my cursor in between and I'll just put my cursor highlighter on there you go the red circle will help me find my cursor so floating in here and holding the alt key I see this little icon with the drop down arrow I click that now that is linking the adjustment layer to this background copy layer so any adjustments I do will only apply to that layer that it's pinned to so now I will go to, so in here you have a mask on that channel in case you don't want to do the whole photo and you've got the actual adjustment uh, settings of the layer. Now I don't do a lot of masking on adjustment layers because whatever's wrong with the photo is wrong with the whole photo. So you don't have to go around and select all the flowers on a dress and adjust the red and then select all the green on the dress and adjust the green not necessary not unless you're getting into the really boutique sort of adjustments uh, reality is that if something's wrong with the photo it's wrong with the whole photo so just the whole photo is one thing now I've got this adjustment levels adjustment layer and if I go channel by channel that gives the best result so picking the cyan channel the blue color um, this graph ideally would stretch from one end of the window to the other end. That would show that cyan was present in all density areas, but it's not. So there's a bit of cyan missing from this end, which is the shadow end. You can see by the dark little pointer there. So let's bring that up and that resets the maximum cyan density to what it should be. There's a little bit missing in the highlight. And this indicates that there's a bit of a blue cast in the highlight. So what I do very delicately on the highlight lighter end is just get move that in to where the meaningful data starts to show. And you'll see if you watch a couple of my examples that this adjustment here is very critical. This shadow end adjustment is much less critical but makes more of a difference to the image. It's just chalk and cheese before and after with that. Um, where the graph goes flat, this is a pixel count, the, the column here. And if there's not many pixels of a particular density, then chances are it's just rubbish and it's not beneficial to the photo. So when you pull it in here, you're kind of flattening those, you're killing those, chopping them off. And you get the real uh, cyan image preserved. So we'll go to the magenta next. So there's a magenta cast in the highlight, that's why there's this gap here. And if we pull that back, if you're watching the image, you'll see it goes a little bit greeny yellow, which is minus magenta. So we're taking the magenta out of that highlight. And like I said, you're very delicate with those. I might even have to come back and get rid of that adjustment, just depending how the photo goes. It's The highlight end is very sensitive. And the yellow channel, same thing. So there must have been a bit of an orange cast to the top end, to the bright end of the photo. It's pretty common. 
uh, the base in the yellow is fine and the black pretty good range on the black so all in all uh, we've done that adjustment now we can see what effect that had if we do before and after so you can see the orange cast skin tones and that everything looks orange and that's what's known as a cast uh, there's a very strong cyan presence in the photo <clears throat> so I think the mid-tone cyan is a bit too strong that might well be borne out by the skin tone values <clears throat> excuse me so skin tone on somewhere like the cheek here if I can get a reading um, depending what tool I've got sometimes that doesn't show okay so the, here's the info palette right here so just watch the values in here as I float over the girl's cheek and I've actually got a very good skin tone now with that adjustment being made uh, the ideal skin tone uh, I'm talking average Caucasian uh, young person's skin without makeup or, or sunburn should be these sort of numbers so you're looking at 15 cyan somewhere in the low teens is fine the magenta, this is the channels down the side here. So low teens for the cyan, then magenta and yellow roughly the same, and in the 30s, and yellow generally more than the magenta. <clears throat> so your ideal numbers there would be like something like 13, 33, 38, something like that. So it's just a little minus in yellow. There is a bit of a flare from the uh, camera flash kind of blowing out the skin tone. If I move around there, you can see the numbers wandering around generally in the right area. A little bit bluey, if anything. A little bit cyan -y. So I think that confirms what I thought, that the mid-tone cyan is a bit heavy. You can see in the parasol. Um, it looks like it should be white, but it could be blue. It's hard to tell. That's quite a lot of cyan showing if it's meant to be white, but the way this photo is we don't know for sure so we just have to guess so let's look at the cyan mid-tone uh, in this cyan graph you can see that most of the cyan pixels are to the left of center so that's more that indicates that it's heavy in the um, cyan so if we slide this mid-tone to the left you see the whole photo warming up and that blue is starting to go out of the parasol and even showing a little bit of magenta now so we'll go to magenta and the same thing so just trying to keep the parasol looking neutral I think is a good thing here so let's look at before and after yeah the tones are much nicer the dress is starting to pop we got rid of that orange cast which kills the greens and blues so I'm happy with that now as far as um, damage goes we'd like to get rid of this staining all down the right hand side <coughs> and I'm going to use the most brutal tool for this so what I'll do is I'll select a sample of this black so try and get a reasonable sampling of that black Oops, so I have to do that again as I need to be on the correct layer. And I will click in here, click in there. There's my black. So that black sample from this area here is now loaded into this swatch. And when I select a brush, it's going to paint that color. So I'll have a look at my brush settings here. Uh, opacity full strength flow full strength airbrush mode and smoothing smoothing doesn't really apply to anything here so if I paint here you can see that puts a pretty good covering of a kind of bluey looking color but it is based on the color I drew from there if I was going to be printing this image commercially I might have to go to a bit more trouble to match that color but um, because I'm just doing a repair for um, personal use here, I'm going to do something that looks good for 
um, on the computer. So now I just pulled back one step there because I clicked here and just watched the edge of the parasol. It's getting some color. So that means the fringe of my brush is a little bit too soft and it's bleeding out into the surrounding territory. So I'll undo that and I will harden the brush and that means holding shift and doing the right square bracket and as I click 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 that the ring gets bigger and what that's doing is showing where the edge of the brush is plus or minus the the soft fringe I don't want a solid edge on the brush if I do that I'll just show you what will happen it goes in very harshly and you can see these hard edges and it's much harder to get something that looks good. So I'll back that off. So now the brush is at maximum hardness because I did shift, right bracket, click, 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 and it went as big as it goes. So then I'll hold the shift down again and I'll go left square bracket, a couple of clicks, maybe three, and you see that ring on the screen shrinks a little bit. And now it's a softer edge, so I can do it there and you can't see the edge of where the brush was. It is bleeding very slightly into that parasol, but I'm going to let that go because I want the brush. I'll go one click harder, but I want the brush to be a little bit soft. So, like I said, this is a brutal adjustment. I don't always do this, but there's nothing under there to save, so I'm not doing any harm. If necessary, I can come back and add a bit of texture to that to make it look nicer, or to change the tone of it, or just to make it look more natural. So I'm just trying to keep this quick here, so I'm going to use the most simple time efficient techniques. <coughs> oh, excuse me, a bit of frog in my throat. Been talking too much. Now the um okay, I'm pretty happy with that. So the other side is a different colour, so if I just hold alt and click in here, I'll pick up a slightly lighter tone. So now my foreground color has changed <coughs> and I can keep painting it in, just getting rid of that rubbish in the background. So already the picture is looking much more friendly. Now what we'll do down here, I don't want to just paint a flat color over this mat, or whatever it is you're sitting on. I want to clone the actual um, texture of it. There's a bit of texture over here. Now, I'm not sure if that left is the same color. It looks the same color by eye, but I don't think it is because it's one of those tricks where, because of the nature of the photo, it looks uh, like they're the same color when they're actually not. I'll just take a sample here and I'll just have a test of it. So that's the color. It's not too bad. Okay, undo that. So what I want to do is this time I'm going to clone. So I'm going to pick up this color and texture and paint it over the damaged stuff here. And there's a couple of interesting little um, quirks to this part. So I'll get the cloning tool. They call it the stamp, shortcut is S. And get the brush size. So right bracket, right bracket, right bracket. And hard shift right bracket. Right bracket, right bracket. It's the size I think I can use. And then I'll go shift and left bracket just to soften the edge of that um, brush a little bit. So I'll just show you in raw terms what I've got. Now, to get the sample, I hold Alt and click in the middle of a clear area of what I want to pick up. So you can see by the little preview there that I've got a soft edge, a little blob of that grey. So I can paint that in over here. Oops, I went a bit too far. I'll paint a small area and I'll see how it looks. See over on the left where I got the sample from, there's a little crosshair that floats around there. That tells you where it's actually sampling from. And this method I'm using, uh, the two follow each other. So I need to keep clicking again to reset that source for the clone. Yeah, I've hit the edge of the picture there, so that's not good. I went a bit too far, so I can only go until I get near the edge. This always starts off a little bit um, fiddly when you're doing this part because you get little edges like that, but luckily it's a soft image. 
Um, so what I'm getting there, it's not ideal. It's darker, it's a different colour. So I might have to um, rethink that method a bit. Now what I'm thinking is that instead of taking it from the other side, I might be better off getting it from this side, even though this is a bit damaged. I think it's going to look a bit better. So what I'll do is I'll just back up the history here. And what I can do is undo some of that cloning that I just did to where I'm happy with it and then start again. So where that is on the history, that means that stuff that I did there is just forgotten and now the image reverts back to six steps back and gives me another chance. So I'll click my sampler in here and I'll see if this looks better. And yeah, I like that much more. Now you notice how the little preview inside the circle is a different colour. That's because it doesn't take into account this adjustment layer I've got on top. It only shows the raw values of the background layer that I'm using as source. So I'm going to keep going in here. I'm going to cover up this damage on the edge. Technically what I'm copying is damaged, but it kind of looks like carpet texture. So I'm going to live with that. And I'm going to say that is going to look presentable. So now this looks a bit weird how it steps up here. Now I can fix that quite easily. I'm a bit clever. I put my cursor right on the line of that carpet and then just move across here and just visually aligning up the edge of the carpet. Just clone the carpet across. And there's nothing to give away the fact that it's cloned. So if I show you before and after, see I just, that's showing it happening again. Just manage to straighten that line out so it looks a bit more natural because your eye will pick up that it's fake every time. Now down here, now a lot of people fixing, like I'm going to fix this little white edge under the dress. Now a lot of people will generally just try and select that area and just paint into it or do a little pixel by pixel thing. And you really don't have to because your tools will help you here. <clears throat> And yes, I do see there's a little flaw just down there, which I'm going to fix also. So I'll do that first. That's from when I was doing that bit I wasn't happy with before. And I'm catching the edge of the image. Like I said, sometimes you get a little bit cornered and you've got to work just a little bit by a little bit. And you always want to be, well, not always, but <coughs> almost always be cloning at 100% density. If you clone less, you'll get little repeat artifacts and little weird effects happening. So it's best to just have it full strength and just put it over. So now the area I'm cloning is quite light compared to the dress. So if I change my cloning tool from normal blending mode to darken, what that'll do is that it'll only apply where it's actually darker than the underlying area. So this grey that I'm sampling is lighter, to my eye anyway, it's lighter than the black or dark green whatever it is of the dress. So if I paint along here, I don't have to have a selection to avoid the edge of the dress because I'll only paint over the white because it's lighter than the sample and it's and the dress is darker so the dress isn't affected so that worked pretty well there's a little ugly artifact there so i'll just change the mode back from darken to normal and i'll set my cloning source nearby so that it gets a similar color and carefully just go along now this is whoops that's got a bit too much of an edge <clears throat> so we go shift left bracket left bracket to soften the edge and when you first put it on, your eye knows. Your eye doesn't want to be tricked, so it says, hey, I can see a difference there. But once you finish it and you move along, your eye will forget that there was ever anything going on there and you'll get away with it. So now there's just a slight sharpness of that edge there from the tool. So what I might do is just run a little blur along there. So, um, oops, the blur tool I want. So this smudge tool is quite good. Oh, yeah, not that one. 
Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do a blur tool. <clears throat> so blur tool running along this edge. You just put a little bit of blur on it. You'll hardly even see it, but what it's worth, that'll just take that little sharpness out of that edge. Lovely. So when you've worked on the image, you know it's there. But people looking at this photo, they're not going to look down and say, oh, there's a bit of an artifact there. They'll just be happy to see a happy looking image. So that is a big improvement already. <clears throat> I'm tempted to try a little bit of sharpening on this image just to see if it does make it look any better. So I'll try non-destructively adding a bit of sharpening to it. So in order to do that, I do need to copy my working layer. So what I'll do is I'll copy this and I'll just call it sharp just to remind me what I'm doing with it and I'll put it to the top. Now remember that I had this adjustment layer pinned. So I'll press Alt and I'll repin that. They got lost because I copied it. So now I've pinned it back again. So there's my adjusted uh, pick and then I'm adding an unadjusted layer over the top. That's going back to the one without the adjustment layer. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do to this is I'm going to do a technique. <clears throat> Sorry, got a bit of a sore throat. Um, uh, I call it the high hard method, high hard, because it's high pass, hard light. So we do in filter, other, we get a high pass. Um, there's a complicated explanation of what high hard, high pass means which I'm not going to go into here, but it's to do with um, changes in uh, contrast and gamma, etc., and separating those out of the colour channels. But anyway, I'm not expert in that technical explanation, so I won't push it. So that is a sharpening layer, and that was made by applying the high pass filter. Now, to make that work, what we do here is we change the mode of that layer, just that layer. So I've selected my sharp layer. I'm going to go to hard light. So hard light makes the grey invisible, the grey of that invisible, but it uses the contrast of that layer to affect um, the contrast of pixels on the fringes of um, elements of the photo. It's hard to explain. But what it does is it lets you kind of home, home in on things that need sharpening. So I turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on. It hasn't really done a lot. It's not. There's a lot of tweaking you can do with this. <clears throat> so what I'll do is I'll try and tweak it up a little bit. So I'll go um, adjust adjustments and levels. So this spike here, that's the grey in that sharpening layer. So if I tweak these in, it adds contrast to the sharpening layer. If I go too far, it'll start to pick up little JPEG artifacts. If I get it just right, it'll actually sharpen like her eyes and the parasol, etc. It's not really working for me, but it's a technique on sometimes it pays off, sometimes it didn't. It doesn't. Um, to me, there's a very minor gain. <clears throat> but because this photo is such low resolution, it's actually picking up some of the JPEG artifacts on her face. And it's ruining it. It's better for the parasol. So technically, I could mask that and just have the sharpening of the parasol. In fact, let's do that. That'll be a bit of fun. I'm keeping it real here. I'm, I'm just making up as I go along. So um, now what I'm doing here is I'm clicking on that little icon which adds a layer mask. So wherever that mask is white, this channel is visible. So if I make that whole uh, mask to black, um, if I get this right, I'm good at getting this part wrong. So I need my defaults. 
and no, I do it back to front. I always get that back to front. Okay, so what I've done is I've filled that mask with black using a shortcut. I won't go into depth on the shortcut. You can see that in another um, tutorial. <clears throat> so what that does, wherever this mask is black, then it hides the effect. In this case, it's that sharpening effect. So in order to sharpen the parasol, what I need to do is paint white onto this. So I'll swap my colors. Now I'll put my highlighter back on. So over here you've got these two little icons with the foreground background color. And if I go D, it sets them to default, which is white foreground, black background. If I press X, it swaps them. So you can work out which way around you want it. <clears throat> and I want to paint on this mask. So what I'm going to do is I make sure the mask is selected. It's got these little corner icons. And hopefully, I always mess this up, so bear with me. I want to paint white onto that. That lets me. No, I'm an idiot. I didn't get my brush. Okay, pretend that never happened. Okay, what I've got is a white brush, and if I paint white, see the little icon here? You can see that patch of white, that's where I just went with the brush. So I'm painting white, and you can see the parasol getting sharper as I go over it. And this is a good little combination of a couple of techniques. And this is non-destructive. I'm not doing anything to the photo that I can't undo by just turning off that layer. So as I paint around here, you'll see it getting very slightly sharper. And this is where the sharpener worked. It didn't work on her face. That was not good. So now if I go Alt and click here, I can see just the layer I was working on. It's turned off the other layers. So I can get an idea of where I am with this um, painting. And this shape here, that's where I've painted white. And the rest is all black. So I'll turn that back on. Now I'll turn off my sharpening layer. Very subtle, but a good improvement in the sharpness of the parasol. I'm just clicking it off, on, off, on. Now I can still play with that. So that hasn't affected her face or anything else. If there was something else I wanted to sharpen, I could do the same thing. I could just paint white on this mask and it will get the sharpening effect. So what I might do is just have a bit of a play and I'll do a, another level adjustment on that mask layer. So I've only got that layer selected. So if I increase the contrast by bringing both ends in, keeping the center in the center, it's going to get sharper and sharper, theoretically. Yeah, it's working in some areas. Like it's not the most brilliant example. I can overdo it here and see if we can just make it really obvious that it's overdone. Yeah, that's about as good as it's going to get. Okay, so that's a little example of how you can um, apply sharpening to just a part of the image. In one easy step. And once you've practiced with that, you can do it in 10 seconds, you know, just to see if it helps or not. If it helps, it helps. If it doesn't, it doesn't. No harm, move on. So there's a couple of little odds and ends around this um, parasol that are a bit ugly. So what I'll do is I'll go back to the paintbrush, which I was already on. Shrink that brush down. Go shift, right bracket, right bracket to go maximum hardness, then back it off a couple of clicks. We're going to shift left bracket. Now pick up that color, so click on the little swatch block, pick up that background color, so now my brush is loaded with exact match of this color. And I'll just do a little bit of painting, make sure I'm on the right layer, which I am. Just a little bit of touch up painting on here. There's some little flaws on the edge of that parasol, but I'm not going to stress about that right now. The main thing is just to make it more even. Now in nature, everything is not smooth and sharp, crisp edges. 
And if you do smooth, sharp, crisp edges, you'll find your work looks artificial. Now we've got a bit of colour shift down the bottom here. So that's all good at the top. And I'm going to resample down here because our background is actually a little bit different colour down here. And if I get the brush right, I'll soften the brush to get when I get away from the parasol area. Paint with a bigger, softer brush just to see. Okay, I like it. <clears throat> now keep in mind here, I'm not doing a boutique restoration here, so don't criticize me and say it's a little bit rough. It is a little bit rough because I'm trying to show how you do this in a reasonable time frame. If you're sitting there with um, 120 family photos to retouch, you don't want to be spending two hours on each one. That'll just get um, that'll just get all out of hand. Now there's a, a little flaw up in the top, which I wouldn't mind addressing. And I think it's actually in the photo session that this parasol was folded down here. And then I've got this bit where I've painted over the edge a little bit. And I'd like to repair those. And there's a pretty easy way to do it. So another good little shortcut here is find the bit that's going to make your repair piece because this is matching pattern so it'll be a good repair and we go control J is a shortcut and what that does is that clones that little selection that I had so see this one here I'll just drag it so you can see it so what I've done is I've actually got a clone piece like that that I can use to repair <coughs> now there is a slight complication because this um, adjustment level uh, is pinned to the background copy. That's where we did our tonal adjustment. So I need two of those now. This is one way of doing it. So I'm going to go Alt. I cloned that adjustment layer. I'm going Alt. So I know this could get a little complicated, but bear with me. It'll make sense. So I've got my original background and I've got the adjustment layer pinned to it. And then I've got this little clone piece, my little repair piece, and um, this. And I've duplicated the adjustment layer. I've got them back to front because this says copy, but they're both the same. Levels and levels, both got the same adjustments in them. There are nicer ways to do it, but this is practical and quick. So I can see what I'm doing. Um, now I'm going to manipulate this little repair piece with the same tonal adjustment to be useful in repairing this broken bit. I'm going to be a bit artistic about it. If I mess it up, I'll fix it in post. But um, <coughs> This will do for a start. So what you're going to do now is erase tool. And I'm going to erase the bits that I don't need. And now without too much trouble, I can make it look like there's never ever any damage. So I'm being, like I said, a little artistic. It won't be perfect. But only you and I will know that I actually fix that. So I'm just erasing any junk that's underneath. <coughs> I'll let it be a little imperfect because a little imperfect is good. Okay, now I want to do the same thing again for that other bit. This bit over here where I've painted a little bit enthusiastically. I think I can easily just reclone this. So what I'll do is I'll do a shift and click on the levels layer and that's going to give me another copy of the piece I just put in complete with the adjustment layer pinned to it so now I've got that that's selected so as I drag hopefully I just get the little bit I want that's that and transform it and drag it in there using cues from the photo itself 
Let's have your Nova. Is everything going to know that you are me? And I'll get my eraser. I've just got to have only the C layer. That's the layer I'm working on. Just erase any extra little bits and pieces. Oh, there's a little bit of flawed stuff there. Okay. So now, like I said, nobody's going to know but you and me. There's a little touch up up in the top of that parasol that does improve the pick. Um, so I'm happy with that. So now I'm getting a lot of layers down here and I want to rationalize those a bit. So the good layers I've got is my background copy and it's adjustment. So I'll just hold shift and select that also. Then I've got my first little patch and its adjustment. I've got my second little patch, its adjustment. And then what I can do is merge layers. So those will go back to being a single layer. And that adjustment that I did, the color adjustment, is now embedded into that particular layer. So that's the final. Um, now I want to blend also the sharpener. And I'm going to go merge layers. So it just merges the ones I selected. So that's my inverted commas final image. And here's the original underneath still. So that's the original. Here's the repair. I'm pretty happy with that for how long has it been? No, longer than I thought. I, I reckon if I was doing that while I wasn't talking, um, probably would have taken me 20 minutes. And I think that's pretty reasonable for what's a pretty uh, substantial repair job. And um, now it looks like something you could put in your album or have as your wallpaper on your phone or whatever. And it's going to look fine. It's far from perfect, but it was quite damaged and a pretty low resolution photograph of a damaged photo. So um, I'm going to say that there's some good techniques in that. And uh, all in all, I'm going to call that a result. And I'll save that and uh, pass it on to the person who submitted it. And uh, I've really enjoyed myself working on this image. And I hope you got something out of watching it. And if you've got an image you'd like me to look at, or if you've got a technique that you want to discuss or suggest or learn, just um, drop me a line and I'll be happy to do it. And you'll see it on what's and all. Maybe uh, you'll even meet Murphy who likes to, that's my cat, he likes to come wandering through the middle of my tutorials sometimes. Anyway, um, this is uh, me signing off and uh, thanks for watching and please share me on your socials. Suggest me to your friends who are doing a family uh, history or something like that and might want some pictures done up and I'll take um, commissions outside of this channel as well or whatever you want. So just uh, whatever you got, send it to me and I'm happy to look at it. Thanks for watching. Bye.